you go to school, everyone looks like you is the same as you. And then you go out of school and everyone doesn't look like you and isn't the same as you. I know something that stood out that your mum said to you, which was like, what's the worst that can happen? Sometimes things just don't go the way they're supposed to. And this is probably the flip side of, you know, being, I guess, a ethnic minority living in another country yeah. where you are even still a smaller minority. But by the time I was 16, I was like, I can't wait to get out. There's a lot of the values or beliefs instilled by our parents to follow that safe route. It's not women. I think it's a characteristic that we, I guess, associate with female leaders. I remember kind of getting taken away by security because they wanted to know where everybody was. And like that evening, my boss actually called me from wherever in the world he was. And I was like, what the hell? I've been dealing with like security and all these people. Where have you guys been? They're looking for you. Da, da, da. And he just said to me, he's like, do you know what? My best advice to you is don't take on this job. He's like, you're too... Namisha. Hi, Anand. Hi. So I did a Google search of you. And anyone else who decides to do the same will see just how extensive or expansive your list of, I'm going to say accolades, because success is, you know, very subjective in how True. people describe it. Yeah. But what really stood out to me was that your ventures don't just extend across high impact moves for you know, they extend across all levels. So we have large corporates to startups to even like how every individual can do their little bit of action to yeah. make a difference. Yeah. And, you know, if I just read out some of the publications you've been on, sure. you know, it's NatWest Business, Top MBA, Great British Entrepreneur Awards, Sloan Dubai and Technology Magazines. Yeah. That's not something that you just by chance stumble upon such no. levels of success. No. So where did this drive or this journey to achieving so much begin and I mean going back to your family roots where mm. did the story of Namisha start before she was born? I think all of that credit grows to my great-grandmother so you know I'm from a Brahmin family from Gujarat so my grandfather emigrated to Kenya maybe in the early or late 30, 1930s and it was only because of her that my grandfather and his brother did this. You know, she was a very progressive woman for her time. Uh, she raised all three of her children by herself. Um, albeit, of course, her husband was there, but she was, she did the lion's share of the work. And when I say progressive, you know, where others were trying to get their kids into like, go work at the farm or get into the field, which was what they did at that yeah. time. Her view was no. There's opportunities out in Africa because at that time so many people were emigrating and she really pushed both of her sons to go. If anything, I think she was probably a little bit of a black sheep of her time because you know, why would you send your son so far away and we just had a war? What if there's another one? These were the kind of things they would be battling with or decisions. And she said, no, there's nothing left here for my sons. Or this is what she would say to other wow. people. Um, I want them to go there and make a future because... If they stay here, then my grandchildren or my great grandchildren will not have the same opportunities. All they'll end up doing is just staying in this little village working on the farm. So the credit goes entirely to her. I think our entire family, or at least all of us, you know, cousins and second cousins from that sort of strand of our family are all driven mm -hmm. by virtue of, I guess, you know, we always have seen our grandparents and parents do this, like pick up and start again or pick up and start something new. And I think they all had the courage to do that because of somebody like her. So, yeah, credit goes to her 100 percent. I love that. And, you know, for the people who followed this show since the beginning, mm. for me, it was exploring my family journey. Yeah. Right. And I was born here. Yeah. So I think we share something where our roots extend the same. Yeah. Whereas you weren't born here. But what I learned through that is, I think it was in, in 1895 where mm. the Protectorate was formed. And mm. then between 1896 for five years, I think over 30,000 Indians moved to, to uh, Africa. To Africa yeah. And I think specifically Kenya. But yeah. most of them was because of the influence of the British promising this. I think they described it as they were creating uh, the America for the Hindu, Hindus. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it wasn't the case when no. they got there i think no. you know in building the railway which some people may know about there's 
almost 3,000 of them died. But yeah. do you know what the feeling was like when your grandparents moved there? Was it as expected? Did they know what they were actually getting into? Or did they also have this thing of what it was sold as wasn't how it initially turned out to be? I wish I'd actually asked my grandparents some of these questions. But from the stories I have collected from my aunts and my, you know, my dad and his siblings, I don't think either of them. So when I say either of them, my, you know, my grandfather and his brother, I don't think either of them knew what they were getting mm -hmm. into. It was just, it was like, oh, mom said this is a good idea, so we better go and do it. It was yeah. that sort of a thing. And and I guess it was also a sense of survival, right? They would realized that if they're, and you know, at that time, I think when both of them had moved across, they weren't even married. So, you know, it was, it was like, well, this is the way we're going to go and build our future. What that future looked like for them, I don't think even they knew. Because it, it's not like they left, you know, this little village in Gujarat called Tarapur to go to, you know, Nairobi or land at Port of Mombasa knowing they had a job. And, you yeah. know, it's, it's so different, like, to how we do it now. We wouldn't move country unless we know, is the house sorted? Is there a job? Is like all these senses of security. But they, I don't think they had that. What they did have or that I do know of was this, oh, so-and-so's son has gone there and did yeah. really well, so now you're going to have the same thing. And I, and I think to a certain extent, because that was the way their mind was framed, they were successful, at least in my perspective of the world. You know, you can end up going to places like this. And like you said, you, you know, most immigrants have suffered atrocities when they've been moved across like this. So they could have had that happen to them, but... No, they, they both went away and made something of themselves by being there. So I don't think they ever had a plan in mind, except that so-and-so did really well. So if they will, so will we. And yeah. then it was just like putting one foot in front of the other and seeing where it went. And so your your parents were also then born in Kenya? Yeah, so my, my father was born in now Tanzania. Okay. Obviously, at that time, it was all just one big block of land yeah. for the British but he was born in Tanzania my mom actually was born in India so she only moved over to Kenya when she got married to my dad um, but yeah my my father was born in Tanzania then the rest of his siblings either in like Nakuru or Nairobi and then they lived there pretty much their whole lives I mean my dad lived there his whole life even when I moved here uh, I would jokingly say, why aren't you moving with me? And he's like, oh, I, I love Kenya too much. Mm. I'm like, well, I love it too. Like, yeah. why am I having to move here? And he's like, no, no. And it was the same thing. Like, actually, when I think back on it now, his response was very similar to what my gran great grandmother say. It's the good thing to do. You know, you'll have opportunities there. It's better for you. So I wonder how much of that is also like rehearsed narrative that they're so used to hearing. So they're just passing it on to yeah. you. Yeah. And, th and this is where I think it's really interesting about that slight divide in our upbringing because mm. I think we're roughly the same age so we come from yeah. that generational influence but here and especially people like me that I know that were born here mm. there's a lot of the values or beliefs instilled by our parents to follow that safe route yes which could be down to you know London being a land of opportunity mm. but it was more of no stay here mm. don't take those risks and I think I know something that stood out that your mum said to you which was like what's the worst that can happen which yeah. I think had had a big influence on on things to come but yeah. was that something that was more common of your friends parents as well there or was it something still quite unique to your family no I think it's it is it's some it's a common trait I see across a lot of you know Asians especially Gujarati Asians who are you know third or fourth generation from Kenya mm. Because I think they've seen a world where, I'm not saying there's infinite opportunity, but if you imagine in the 50s and 60s and 40s when they were moving there, there wasn't really much there. I mean, in the 50s, I know when Queen Elizabeth went for her first visit, at that point, I think Nairobi was just about becoming a center of like commerce and finance. Up until then, there wasn't anything there. So their perspective of the world has been there's enough to go around. Mm. And, and I see that trait in all of them. I also see that same trait in their children and some of like my friends. We see that opportunity as like an exciting thing to do. It's like a challenge, something yeah. new, less daunting, less nerve wracking. And I think that comes from constantly seeing our parents pave that pathway. So for us, actually, that's normal. 
And then sometimes when we'll hear the opposite, like some of my peers and friends here, and they'll say it to me. So I'm like, aren't you ever going to stop? Like that list of yours is getting really yeah. long. Don't you ever want to stop? And I often am the one who's saying to them, but that doesn't daunt me. Like that's kind of what I enjoy about life. But yeah. I can appreciate for others that is scary. Um, so yeah, I think I think it's a common trait of a lot of us who are East African Asians. It's just kind of in our blood because we've seen them do it all the time. And did you mainly have friends of a similar background? You know, yes, I did. Unfortunate, well, fortunately or unfortunately, at that time, and again, this is probably the flip side of you know being, I guess, a ethnic minority living in another country yeah. where you are even still a smaller minority. Um, so it was like the safety in numbers thing. So my dad actually sent me to a school which which was predominantly Asian people throughout my life. So all my friends and peers were Asian. And there was definitely that that sort of thing I, I saw my parents instill in me quite often, which was do more Asian stuff. Like, you know, so I got into Indian classical dancing. So, you know, that stuff I learned whilst I was there. There is definitely this element of safety in numbers because you're kind of all together or there's usually this well you know if they have the same types of friends then they'll enjoy the same cultures and they'll speak the same languages and stuff like that but for me I actually found that quite jarring because yeah. you know you go to school everyone looks like you is the same as you and then you go out of school and everyone doesn't look like you and isn't the same as you and then you also have friends who go to different schools, which are so diverse and multicultural, like, you know, international schools, British schools, all that kind of stuff. And you kind of do sit there and wonder, like, uh, now when I reflect back on it, I think, were we kind of fed a false reality of what the world was like? Because, you know, from the age of like five to 16, it was like, this is your bubble. And it's just a, forgive my English, but it's a bubble of just brown people. Right. Yeah. So, so where do you go from there? And so I think moving here when I was 16 was just that much more exciting for exactly that reason. Sounds ridiculous when I say it out loud, but I couldn't wait to be out of that brown bubble. Yeah, for sure. And in, you know, London, like multi-cultural, diverse, like so many people, I was excited to go to school with like kids of different races and stuff like that, which you wouldn't hear people talk about, but that's the stuff I was looking forward to because I craved that wanting touch points with different cultures and that sort of thing so yeah and where do you think that particular <clears throat> mindset came from I think I used to see my father and uncle just constantly interacting with so many people within business and they would be coming over to the house and it's like here's Nigel from Germany and here's John from like America and you know Shadi from Israel and it's just like wow where do all these people yeah. come from what do they do and so I always was curious about who are these people? Where do they come from? What's Israel like? What's this like? And I think also one of the downsides of like growing up in Kenya is your parents are always like, if we want to take a holiday, it's either we're going to India or we're going to like Masai Mara or like, it's never, let's go explore a completely yeah. different culture. So I think the combination of all of those things, like by the time I was 16, I was like, I can't wait to get out and like, you know, get in, come to London. And then more so when I was 21, it was just more, I want to go travel the world. I want to see like how other people live. And and that then has informed the point you made earlier, which is, you know, whatever I do, it touches on various parts of society, whether that's business, people, culture, wildlife, animals, nature, because that's, I guess, the framework of my upbringing. I've been exposed to all these things or naturally curious about them. It's interesting because that was one of the key takeaways that, I got from I'll even say unexpected takeaways mm. that I got from uh, gathering those family stories yeah. because my grandfather he owned a I think it was the largest grocery shop when they moved to Ginger they constantly had Europeans who were coming in and because of that that's what exposed my dad and his siblings mm. who helped in the shop mm. to those international yeah. people which mm. meant that when they came here mm. integrating became that little bit easier, easier yeah. not completely easy, but yeah. it meant that they were able to relate. And so I think that, yeah, hearing you say that, it, I can see how you were able to not only appreciate, but adapt yeah. following that move here. And I also think it's interesting you sharing that insight, given me one, which is, it's probably the reason like my dad and uncle with myself and my two cousins, we're, we're all girls, insisted on giving us that kind of upbringing because from their view of the world, they were 
you know, thrown into Africa with very few Asians around. There's only like a handful of families. So they're kind of responding from a completely different perspective. Like, yeah, we live in a multicultural city of Nairobi where there's lots of people from all parts of the world who live there. But because we've grown up this way, we don't want our kids to grow up this way. So we're mm. going to send them to the Asian schools and make them do like the Gujarati lessons and all that kind of stuff. So it's just interesting to see like how people respond yeah. based on how they've been raised. Exactly. Yeah. And so you said earlier that your father was the one who told you to move. Yeah. So, you know, funny enough, when I was born in Kenya, um, both my parents were overseas British citizens because when they were... Well, when my father was born in Tanzania at the time, it was British. And when my mom married him, she became British. But unfortunately, when I was born, they both the UK government and the Kenyan government changed their immigration and like naturalization rules. So I couldn't naturalize it. I, I wasn't a Kenyan citizen, even though I was born there because I was born to British parents. So I, I should inherit their right. Mm -hmm. And then the gov British government here said, well, you're born in Kenya, you're not born in Britain. So... You know, a British citizen either. So up until I was 16, I was stateless. I actually didn't, I couldn't travel also. The only way I could was probably on my mom's passport. But as far as I was concerned, I was a stateless citizen. I didn't belong to any state. So it was like this whole thing in, in Nairobi at the time with organized by the Hindu council to get, because it wasn't just me. There were lots of other people who fell into this category. And then they came here to UK parliament. They petitioned parliament, changed the rule. Mm. And it meant that we, people like me could come and claim our citizenship, but we'd have to come quickly and start the process so it was like yeah you're you know it wasn't like do you want to do this it's like you're doing this and wow. this is going to happen and I think because I'd grown up my whole life not being able to travel like imagine like your friends come back from school holiday like oh I went to Disneyland in, in Paris and I'm like oh I can't go there because I don't have a passport you know like yeah. so I couldn't wait when my dad said you this is what you're doing I was like yep yeah, game on like if it means I can travel and like yeah. go see the world yeah I'm up for it so yeah, my whole perspective on it was very different because I just saw it all as this is going to be opportunity creation for me in every aspect. Yeah. Yeah, it's an amazing mindset to have. And so you then started schooling here. Yes. What did you do there? So I so I did my A levels here. I'd done my GCSEs from Nairobi and then moved here. So I studied um, textiles, business studies and geography. Because but you initially wanted to do art I did yeah yeah I was very I mean I still am I still enjoy painting and drawing and all that kind of stuff um, so I always had it in my mind that I wanted to go to art school and get into foundation college go to like central St. Martin's and then I didn't know what I would do with myself but I wanted to be an artist and I got a C in my GCSE art so all the schools I was enrolled in here said, oh, well, I mean, we're not going to let you take art. And and also, funny enough, I did really well in like maths, chemistry and other subjects, which I had like no passion for. So they would be pushing, they were pushing me to say, take maths, take chemistry, like, because they obviously wanted you to pick subjects you're good at. And I was like, no, I still want to do art and I'm going to do textiles and this and this. So eventually we managed to find a school that was accommodating of that. But that was a whole very very strange experience for me because now I've, I've gone from like 16 years of co-education to like an all-girls school you know I think 16 year old girls who have been in an all-girls school their mindset is very different mm. I had a lot of male friends and that's who I used to hang around with so I don't feel like I ever really fit into that environment I think I just kind of stuck my head down I was like right it's a means to an end let's just get through these two years and do it well and then head off to uni. So yeah, not sort of the best memories those two years. But then again, I think it's just how I'm wired. If I look back on those two years alone, so much growth, you know, again, like living in London, being independent, like in mm. Kenya, you couldn't go anywhere without like the car or the driver here. I could like jump on a bus, get on the tube. And it was so funny, like whenever I would meet some of my girlfriends from school and be like, let's go into London, like, let's go to this or that. And they're like, how do you know how to get around on the tube? I was like, you guys live here. How do you not know that? Right. And that's when I started to realize these subtle differences in the emigrant experience and how that's changed the way your parents have raised you versus how others are raised like a lot of the girls like you know at that time were generally very fearful like not that that's a mentality but everything was like fear-based so it's like oh you can't get on a train by yourself because what if something happens and I'm like it's a public train with like CCTV what are you scared of so it's it's that's when I started to see that yeah the way I've been raised and the experiences I've been exposed to have definitely 
a different way of thinking and approaching problems yeah. lower fear mindset i guess yeah. yeah and i guess it's it's also it's something that i often say where there's risks and being risky but then there's calculated risks yes exactly. right and it's you know you can apply it to this where it's like i understand the risks but mm -hmm. you know there's a calculation of not to just say risk versus reward but you know like you say the cctv there's there's ways to control the potential dangers versus what i'm going out there to explore and also being aware of that yeah. right like i think now when i reflect back I, I often like with all those friends think maybe they just weren't aware of that like maybe mm. you know they'd never sat down and thought actually i'm probably safe on a tube because of this or this or this or if i'm in trouble i can do this or this or this which is how i would always think that theirs was always oh my god mom and dad told me not to do this so i can't do right. it like it's always that so i think also the different mindsets and mentalities meant that I chose like friends in different circles. A lot of my friends are much older than me, like already at uni. And that's when I started to see that I really relish those sorts of relationships where you're spending a lot of time talking about bigger things. Mm. And I think that's just the type of person I am. Like if someone asked me, what's your favorite thing to do when you're hanging out with friends? Like having big conversations yeah. about big ideas and like not how are we going to solve the world, but if it's in that category, great. I love it because I like anything that stretches your mind, mental challenge, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And then so how did the shift to tech come about? That was really, really interesting. So I went off to uni and um, didn't, didn't get into art school because even though I did the AS level art, I got a C again. So I think at that point, <laughs> my <laughs> teachers were like, you may love it, but I don't think you're good at it. And I was like, okay, I can accept that. So it was, what's the next best thing to do? And, you know, my dad was like, well, you could do anything. And I said, oh, I, I think I'm going to follow your footsteps, dad, and I'm going to go learn business. So that's what I went to do. And then in my second year, you know, and typically people will be applying for internships and stuff like that. I was the same. I mean, I think when I was at uni, I was all about like, getting the best grade, achieving, achieving, achieving for those first two years, because I thought if I have the job, uh, then I'm done. I don't have to worry about anything after that. That's what my mentality was. So I worked so hard to get onto internships and got a really good one at Barclays Capital the summer that the credit crisis happened. Wow. So yeah, I've, I saw it unfold firsthand in front of me. And at the whole time, I was very fascinated by banking and finance and, you know, again, big picture, problem solving capability of finance. So for the first five weeks was loving it. And then the morning that Black Monday, when it was the, the crunch actually happened, my entire team that I was working with didn't show up to work. And I remember kind of getting taken away by security because they wanted to know where everybody was. And like, I can't really talk about it too much, but it was a really daunting experience. And then that evening my boss actually called me from wherever in the world he was. And I was like, what the hell? I've been dealing with like security and all these people. Where have you guys been? They're looking for you, da, da, da. And he just said to me, he's like, do you know what? My best advice to you is don't take on this job. He's like, you're too, you're not, he said, what do you say? You're not the right type of mentality for a job like this. I was like, why? He's like, because you just want to see the good in the world. And these are not the places where things like that happen. And I was like, okay. And he hung up and I never heard of, heard of him after that. I think he had like, you know, handed in his notice, like I'm done and leaving. And that changed my whole perception of value creation, right? Like just seeing all of that unfold, like what's the value you can create through the financial sector? Well, we know it, but we don't see it in example. And then I started to turn my attention a lot to technology and kind of seeing where that was proliferating and how it was growing and just got fascinated by it. So when I back back at uni for my third year, I think my I think career counselor was like, right, so how many applications are we making this year? And I was like, just one. Just one application, one company. I know what I want. And there's something really rewarding about going through something like that where you can walk into something being so sure of yourself, saying, I know I want this and I, I trust it so much that I'm not even going to try and cast my net anywhere else. And I got the job. So got my job at Accenture they deferred me for a year which meant I could travel for a whole year and yeah it's just like the best way to start your career and went into Accenture and again when I started there was really funny at all these like uh, executive directors who work in banking the banking practice going oh my god you've got all this amazing experience in banking come work with us and I was like no I think I'm gonna go work with the energy and resources practice and that's how all of my experience into like smart grid, smart energy, renewables, like putting in, you know, big renewable capacity in like the North Sea, working with Shell, working with the C-suite at Shell, like it just, 
spun out and I think it was the passion for tech and looking at like where you could apply it in mm. contexts that actually have meaningful impact is what fascinated me and you know if, if people were to ask me oh you've got such a big list of accolades I'm like well it's really driven from trying to solve problems it's not it's not like oh okay well I want to be Forbes 30 under 30 next year it never starts like that it's always hey let's tr- what if we got the C-suite at Shell to start rethinking the way they look to energy production? And then what happens from there? So it's it's those sorts of things, yeah. You mentioned something there that links back to something that I've been reading recently, but and it's also something you've said in a previous interview where mm. you went down the route of being more solution-focused rather yeah. than success-focused. Yeah. And when I heard that, what it reminded me of is um, Simon Sinek's book, yes. Leaders Eat Last, Leaders which Eat is Last, yeah. amazing, amazing book. Yeah. And do you think this... Well, let, let's just go into that. So firstly, yeah. what did you mean by you took the angle of being more solution focused versus success focused? I think when you make a solution, your metric for outcome, let's not say success, outcome. How am I going to measure an outcome that it worked or didn't work? It has to be a solution for it to work. And so that's how I trace back and go, well, if I solve a problem, I know that I'm not only creating success for me, but for the people who it's a real pain point for. And so by virtue of solving the problem, it's going to be a success. So whereas if I think you're just success focused, that's kind of a false, false economy because you're just chasing either a title. So like I just said earlier, right? I want a Forbes 30 on 30. Yeah, but what does that mean? Mm. Like, Or how are you going to get there? And I see this all the time when also like I see young people I mentor through like the trusts I work with. They're always like, oh my God, you've done so many things. How can I be you? I'm like, yeah, just don't look at what I've done. Like find some passion for what you really enjoy and solve problems in that space. And yeah, exactly to what you say. That, And I think it's also from that same book where Simon Sinek gives an example of someone called Bob Chapman. Mm. And the example that he gives in that is that he took over, I think it was a company, go like a distressed company where Mm. he he was told to go in there to rescue. rescue. And he sat down with one of the staff members and asked him for his raw and honest opinion. And the the staff member said, I'm afraid to tell you what I think because I think my job will be at risk if Mm. I say it. Mm -hmm. And Chapman made the point very clear that this is a space where you can say what you want and I can guarantee it doesn't affect your Formation, situation. Yeah. Um, and so he was a factory worker and he said, I, when I went to the offsite, I felt a lot more comfortable there away from you know, my peers and the team than when I came back. And the reason he felt that is because as a factory worker, they had a separate place to clock in yeah. versus the people who worked in ops or behind the desk at the computer, exactly, yeah. which meant they were on a time, they could only take lunch a certain time. If they needed to phone home, uh, to speak to a family member or make any emergency call, they'd have to use the payphone, payphone right? Yeah. Whereas everyone in the, Office at your desk, just, yeah, just pick, pick up, up the phone. phone yeah. So what really stands out and, and what relates to what you said is that idea of, well, trust and empathy, which yes. I think Chapman calls it true human leadership. Yes. And the reason I bring that example up is because from what I've read into everything that you've done, and yeah. I know we're going to get into that, that point really stood out where you even say that all the way from the manager down to the janitor, by making them feel that they have a role to play in making the company do what it does and empowering them to have the same rights. So I think Chapman took all the locks and all the, you know, security accesses to places away. That was, you know, something that shifted something in my head where Mm. in my corporate jobs, I've never been exposed to an environment that doesn't have that level of safety. But at the same time, it does have this effect that you separate yourself from the other people who have more privileges. So was it these things that you'd been through in your the work that you've described your early years of work that instilled this in you? Or do you think you always had this perspective on people to give them this equal opportunity and to empathize with people no matter where their background or where they've come from yeah I think it's the latter like I've from a very I mean from when I can remember even people reflecting on me as a child they said you've always been empathic Mm -hmm. like you you want to understand people's situation and and I'm like that like I can't observe somebody and not want to know like what are they doing or how are they feeling And in my early part of my career, I started to learn that was a true asset when you're building teams, you know, like exactly that. Who's accountable for what? And that's not like, let's point a finger, but let's use that as a tool to empower. 
And then the other part of it was, well, who's missing out on the opportunity to have a chance to be involved? So it's looking at it from both of those sides. And again, even like in all of the sort of early consulting, like analyst roles that I had, my job was to always go and bring different people who had differing opinions around a table and get them to agree to things. So I always believed that A, everyone has a role to play because sometimes even when you're trying to solve problems, you don't realize where the problem is coming from until you get everyone around the table. Sometimes it's like, you know, Chapman, that example you just gave, the issue was something as simple as somebody being able to pick up a phone and call at the convenience yeah. when they want to. It's very easy to miss those sorts of nuances if you don't have everyone around the table. And a lot of that is reframing the way people think about business or teams or dynamics or how people work together to say like everyone has something to contribute rather than doing it the other way where we we build teams based on roles so we say we need a graphic designer we need a lab technician blah blah, blah. we don't say here's an outcome we're trying to achieve how can we make that happen with what we have right now and that makes you resource centric as well so mm. you start to like use less or need less because you find the resourcefulness within yourself. So it's like, yeah, all these traits that came together from working in those environments. And so now it's like second nature. Like I, I'll see someone across the boardroom, if they're just sitting quietly and I'll be, that's the one I want to pick on to say, what's your viewpoint? Because they're mm. the quiet one and I want to hear what they have to say. So yeah, it's, it's innate. Like I'll always spot that in a room, be like that person's not said something or they've got something to say, like trying to bring them into the mix. Yeah. And let's get into that yeah. shift that you made from having someone as a boss to mm. being your own boss. <laughs> yeah. So embarking on this journey of entrepreneurship. Yeah. Where did that begin? I think I always knew I would be my own boss because I'd seen my dad do it. So I actually didn't know any other way. You know, sometimes when I like listen to my friends going, oh, my dad's boss told him to do this. And I'm like, yeah. what? Yeah. Your dad's boss told you to do what? Like, because my dad was his own boss. So no one told him what to do. So I always had it in my mind that I that's what I wanted for myself. I didn't know how I, that was going to happen. It's not like I used to sit there like, you know, these kids were like, I have an idea to like this. It was never like that. It was it was more of a desire for a lifestyle where I got to choose what I did. So it always stemmed from there. And then I guess, you know, going through uni, going through the consulting career, I started to realize that there were there it comes back to the whole problem solving thing right so i saw that the way i'm solving things or my approach is not typically an approach that most consultants employ or are brave enough to even vocalize that that's what they want to do i thought to myself well a i've got something unique and i recognize that it's obviously going to take a lot of time before the rest of the world recognizes i've got to prove my worth so the only way i can do that is by putting my name to my own brand and building from there. And then the other part of it was also feeling the frustration of working with this. There's also a big generational gap, like at the time in corporate when I joined, because it was like you had all these 90s kind of corporate people who were so set in the ways of like expense cards and living a completely different corporate lifestyle to those who joined in the 2000s, more team centric, more work life balance, all those sorts of things. Unfortunately for me, I always ended up working for people who who were those 90s, like two suit tie, be here at seven o'clock, don't leave till 10 kind of a thing. And I had enough of that because I could see that's not how, A, you don't build meaningful, healthy lifestyle from being like that. And also you just don't get job satisfaction. So I was, I think I just got to a crossroad. I think it was the third time I'd been in a consulting setting, feeling the same emotion and going okay, I should just stop moving from job to job and just do this by myself. Because I think that the, the two previous times I moved, it was just more of a fear. It was like, I know I can do this myself, but I'm too scared to, because what will this person say? Or what will people think? Am I being irresponsible? Blah, blah, blah. So all of that combined, I think in 2015, I just had like a snapping point where I was like, right, that's it. I've had enough. I'm doing this by myself. And even at that point... I set up the company, everything, not knowing like, where's my first client going to come from? What am I even going to consult on? No idea. And I, I'm a big believer, like when when you make plans, God laughs at you because he's like, oh, I've got something else up my sleeve. Right. And literally the next day I had an ex-colleague from like a project I'd worked on calling me up going, yep, Eon Energy up in Nottingham are doing a big smart meter deployment. They need a project manager. You're a little bit junior, but I think you can do it. Put you forward. They loved you. You got the job. And I was like, what? You didn't even want to interview nothing. He's like, no, they've just seen everything you've done on paper and they're happy. They just need someone to get started. I was like, okay. 
and it just it just grew from there and everything has grown organically like everything we've done all all the clients we've worked with even the projects like sometimes I sit there and I just think to myself like when you were saying earlier let's talk about your list of accolades I was just thinking but those are all things that have just happened by chance or mm. by luck or virtue like and I know when you read that list it looks like that were very calculated things I've done but it was all just falling into the right place at the right time like you know it was really exciting time working with Centrica to build their whole electric vehicle business at a time when like EVs were just becoming popular so yeah I, I like my method it works it like gives me and my team you know more interesting diverse clients to work with and interesting opportunities so there's there's the risks that you took and I think from this conversation I can see where that mentality has come from mm. the one thing that was a talking point was when it came to women in entrepreneurship mm. now this is probably since you know 2010 or something where yeah it was still quite uncommon mm. for women to go into a lot of fields in entrepreneurship unless it was, you know, the likes of fashion or, yeah. you know, general retail, personal yeah. care, because the industry was very much characterized by masculine yes. traits, yep. right? And the reason I bring that up is because I've talked about this before. There's this thing called stereotype threat yeah, yeah, where yeah. women, or it doesn't just have to be gender, but anyone from a background where they feel a minority into mm. something they're looking into there's this internal barrier which is called that stereotype threat which means they will almost disassociate from pursuing it mm. and you know there's an example of uh, a study done where when this conference was shown to a group of women scientists yeah. there were two versions shown and one was shown where there was a mix of genders and one was shown where it was, it was predominantly male yeah. and three times less women decided to sign up for the conference when, because, when, of the men, because of the yeah. one that was dominated yeah. by men was this something that you came across and if you did how did you overcome those external and internal battles for oh, that's a good question um See, the thing is, I think it didn't just start with entrepreneurship. Like, I would experience these sorts of stereotypes even in consulting, if if anything, more so. I felt like when I went and became an entrepreneur and started my startup journey, I actually was exposed to, or I would find more women I could talk to about these things, you know, women who were doing this. In In consulting, though, I had experienced something very opposite. So... I would come across female leaders who, you know, on the surface, when you see female leaders, you're like, great, paving the pathway, it's an example for me. But these female leaders were often, it's literally like a man trapped in a woman's body. So all the traits, all the behaviors are very masculine, very male, -dom like it, you feel like you're sitting with a man, you don't feel like you're sitting with a female or all those things you value in a woman around empathy, gentleness, all those things. And I'm not saying that only women have that, men have that too. But this is what I had started to experience. So actually my perspective on the world was quite the opposite. I kind of walked away from consulting feeling like a bit of a joke from the outside because mm. you know there's all these companies touting their LGBTQ and we're so diverse and look at how many female leaders you have and look, we now have a female CEO. But all these women don't possess those traits that you would want from female leaders or what we look for. In my entrepreneurial journey, I met way more women. And I think these women were kind of able to be themselves because there's a sense of emancipation when you start something of your own and it's on your own terms. You're not trying to like fit into someone else's box or, you know, like square pegs and round holes. It's really on your terms and it's it's your own expression of how you would do things. So I felt quite the opposite. I felt like in the entrepreneurial space, women are much more emancipated. They're more free. They're, they're able to do what they, well, not like they're restricted, but even in terms of business choices, they, they make different choices. But where it started to get really, really interesting was when I started to come across technology female founders who are like going after the big picture problems and how they approach solution driven stuff and how if we had more women, and again, I want to be careful when I say this because it's not women. I think it's a characteristic that we, I guess, associate with female leaders, which all leaders could have. It's not just that you have to be a woman to have these characteristics, but those things that we value in women, I saw so much in these female tech founders. And then when they applied that to the problems they solve, it's like, it's a, 
it's just a world of its own, the way they think about how to solve problems. Like one of my mentors, she's one of the top like AI gurus in, in parliament at the moment. And she fortunately is one of my mentors. And, you know, it's really funny, like the, one of the first sessions I had with her, she was like, right, so what's your, what, what's your plan? So I said, what, for the next 10, 12 years? And I thought she was asking what's the plan for the business. She goes, no, I'm, no love. What are you going to do with the next hundred years when you build all these companies? What wow. are they going to do? And I was like, whoa. No one's ever asked me that. She goes, we're building for the next 200 years. She goes, I've already built technology, which is like going to be used 200 years ahead. And I'm like, whoa, like we don't even have spaces like this where we can come and have these kinds of conversations. So I do think there's something about more women, entrepreneurs, leaders, just allowing, I guess, people to try not to fit into boxes, just... You know, and that's why I said it's not a woman thing or a man thing. I think mm. it's just personality traits that anyone could learn and be that way. But yeah, that really blew my mind. She was like, we're planning for 200 years. What are you talking about? And I was like, oh, okay, I'm really far behind. Yeah, I'm going to need to look into some of the <coughs> yeah, some well, stuff, get some of the insights. Yeah. And so then you started Quantum Venture Partners or was there something yeah. before? So, so Quantum Consulting was the first company I started and then Quantum Ventures spun off it from ha again you know meeting so many startup founders so many women and I guess the one problem that I used to actually hear them come across so often was the access to funding so QVP was set up to kind of support access to funding for those sorts of opportunities and I think we've always been careful not to say we're focused just on women because we're not again it's a, it's it's the personality and traits that we want founders to be able to have to succeed so yeah that's how we started and everything we work on is very high tech so it's very much like a lot to do with artificial intelligence and healthcare ai and mental health uh using ai and vr to like look at how we can combat climate change so it's big picture problems and then how do we apply technology to solve them yeah you describe it as focusing on working with companies that are driven by impact creation and mm. sustainability mm. what or have you seen mm. that the people that you work with share any common trait amongst them all they're all crazy no. yeah. <laughs> Um, what is the most common trait between all of them? That their purpose is bigger than themselves. You know, they're big, the biggest driving force behind all of them is what they, one, they believe massively in what they do, but that that is bigger than themselves. So even if they hit a stumbling block or it's like, you know, we, we weren't able to raise the last round. The concern is not, oh my God, how are we going to raise a round? It's, oh my God, if I don't get the solution into the NHS in time, we're going to have a big mental health crisis. It's that's how they're driven. So, yeah, I would say the most common trait are just their stuff is bigger than they are. That's what comes first. And, you know, what I love about this is you get a lot of people who almost I don't want to make it sound too bad, but, you know, they know how to talk the talk. Right. And it's um, it's very easy to to be like, yeah, you know, Namish is making a lot of sense. Mm. I get it. But I think it's it's knowing how much you back that up with the work you're doing, because, yeah. you know, like I touched on in the beginning, you help these impact startups and if someone thinks of a startup they think of some company that is trying to grow mm -hmm. and you grow for the sake of you know raising awareness or growing your influence and in whatever your product is but again Correct. it's also to grow you need size and you, you need money yeah exactly. um, what I love about the the work that you do is it it doesn't stop there so you have the project called leaving leaving, leaving a, a legacy. legacy yeah so that leaving a legacy is a non-profit startup that my husband and I started and again problem solvers right so we, we we kept coming across like all these really interesting grassroots environmental projects and it, it was all it was all founded from like people wanting to help themselves improve their own circumstance so like kids in like shanty towns in Nairobi who like we just want to be able to get electricity in our houses or we will we, we just want to be able to collect rainwater so we can have clean water and not fishing it started with things like that and from there, it you know, obviously putting two and two together, like, great, we, we know, now know all these projects. How do we give them funding or get them access to funding? So it was like, put the fund, you know, your startup hat on. How do you raise? How do you do that? And it's just grown from there. And now we we're launching an app, which is supposed to be a collective platform where people can come in and support this work. I think what people sometimes don't realize is that, or at least with the work that I do, I don't do these things because I feel like, 
um, that's going to be like the next great thing on my CV or notch on my belt. I do these things because the reward in it is improving someone else's situation through things that, well, things they did themselves, but you're just facilitating. Mm -hmm. So like even with these communities that we work with, they, they always say to us, oh, thank you so much. You made all this happen. And we're always reminding them, like, we didn't do anything. We just structured all your thinking and gave you some context to put it in. Um, so, yeah, I think all the things that I'm doing in that sort of impact lens is always driven from a place of improving someone else's situation so they can then improve someone else's. It's like, how do you create that effect? There's this clear drive in you to not only want to help improve others, like you said, but almost this feeling of, giving back because mm. some of these projects that you talk about it's about reducing carbon emissions uh helping world wildlife loss but in places that you probably would have been familiar with yeah. growing up yeah why do you have this desire to give back to a place that was once part of you because of exactly that it was part of me you know i credit all of my own version of success like like we said we wouldn't use success but like whenever I think of the things I've achieved or done I credit that all back to my upbringing and growing up there and it's not just the Kenya thing it's the kind of upbringing I had you know I, we're always around nature like every weekend it was about going to like Nakuru or to like a national park and like checking out flamingos or watching a migration or going to Rift Valley it was always outdoors nature centric it was always um appreciating those sort of things and i think as i grew up i realized that by doing all those things i got these innate traits and sensibilities which i would have never got if i was raised there and you know we've talked about so much of that today like we've unpacked so many things so reflecting back on all of that yeah i mean it shaped me so i feel a massive sense of duty almost to to do my part because I wouldn't be who I am if I wasn't raised the way I was and where I was. It's funny because you saying that is it's something that occurred to me when I was listening to one of the episodes that you've done. And I'll, I'll share that in the mm. description for people who want to hear that as well. But something that you mentioned in that growing up, you you realize that business, government and society are intrinsically linked and yeah. seeing how the role that we play in its progress or degradation. And I think you're referring to like the environment and society both. The reason that stood out is because looking back on my, my youth and growing up and, mm -hmm. and my early years, it's not something that really ever played on my, my. conscience or mm -hmm. even my, my circle of conversation. And that makes me think that, you know, part of just like you say, growing up in that kind of environment, do you think it made you more aware to these kind of, I guess, sensitivities where you could see those developments or lack of developments unfolding in front yeah. of you? Yeah, because the differences you saw were so stark. Yeah. And, and it was just in front of your face, right? Like you could drive out of your school, go up the road, and you'd be in the poorest part of Nairobi. And you'd see it every yeah. day in front of you. If that's what you're seeing all the time, it, it's, it's second nature to you to think, well, how can I make that better or this better? And then again, it's like, like I said, you know, I think it's most Asian families in East Africa they all do this. They, they, you know, they have, they give back to society. Their activities they're regularly involved with. And I, so I think that all of us like feel that sense of duty to do something back because, I mean, look at where we are. It goes back to what my great grandma said. Like if my, if my grandparents had moved, would any of us be doing any of this? Like in 2014, a few of us cousins went back to that like old village where my great grandma lived and we went up the street where the house was. And I could see it on all of my cousins' faces. Like they were just looking at me. Because I had been there before. They hadn't. And they were just looking at me like, is this where they used to live? And I said, yeah. They're like, wow. Imagine we would all be living here now if like they hadn't made those changes. So, yeah, it's just an insane sense of, I guess, duty, responsibility. But also, this is something you love. You don't, you know, if, if, if it can give me this, it will be able to give so many other people the same thing. So it's just about educating and making people appreciate that and hopefully experience the same thing too. No, I love that. And what is Becoming X? Becoming X is sort of two-part company. Becoming X Limited is a education company that's set up by Bear Grylls and Paul Gurney. So Paul Gurney was one of my old mentors uh, at Accenture, still a very good friend of mine. So they set up Becoming X for very similar reasons. 
um, you know, I mean, everyone who knows Bear Grylls knows that his childhood had a big influence mm. on how he saw the world and how much he achieved and what success meant for him. So he, him and Paul set up this company to give every child those sorts of lessons and opportunities that they wouldn't typically get in a classroom. And I resonated with that so much because most of my things I've really tangible lessons I hold on to are things I've learned outside the classroom. So then they set up Becoming X Foundation, which is their charitable arm, and I'm one of their trustees. So Becoming X Foundation has a mission to educate one million children across Africa using the tools that the parent company produces and giving it to kids in all different sorts of circumstances all across Africa to, you know, show them that opportunity is not just born in classrooms, it's also born in other places. And I think that's so important for the context of Africa because, you know, still people not we don't have 100% education out there like not every kid gets to go to school so how can we create opportunities for those who don't and actually show them that you know they have something to contribute to valuably to society and it just just because they didn't go to school doesn't mean they can't contribute it's, mm. to, it's to that effect yeah it's amazing this as we discussed at the beginning many ventures you're involved in yeah. so do you have to put a lot of trust in a lot of different people in order to make these things work as they do. Yes. How do you instill that trust or that faith in people that they can deliver, you know, ultimately what are big change making initiatives that you're looking to? I would be lying if I said it's just great motivational speaking and like getting them all, you know, um, trained and aware of what they're supposed to do. But actually, it's quite the opposite. I think with most of the people I work with, um, and they find this really jarring, the first few months when they work with me, I'm always about, let's have some fun together. And they're always like, what's wrong with you? Like, don't you want to do some work? And I'm like, yeah, we'll get to the work, but I want to get to know you. I want to see like, what makes you tick? What motivates you? How do I get the best out of you? And the only way I'm going to do that is by knowing what you're like when you're having the most fun. So I spend a lot of time doing those sorts of things so that you build that no like trust factor. And it's both ways, right? Like you've got to trust them. They've got to trust you. You've got to enjoy working with each other. So the fun part is also a big thing for me because I'm like, trust is one thing, but I also think you have to genuinely enjoy working with people, mm. especially when you do these sorts of like sometimes quite heavy subjects. Sometimes you could be sitting in meetings listening to really heavy stuff for ages, but you've got to be able to have fun. So my biggest driver when it comes to my team and how I build with them is a let's all find a common ground and then work up from there. I'm very aware of where what they're able to do and what they enjoy doing. That's my big thing. They Like for me, I have to make sure they're doing stuff they enjoy because again, that's how I'm going to get the best out of them. So it's a combination of all of those things, but it is a lot about trusting others to deliver a part of your mission, right? So yeah, that requires a lot of trust and oftentimes faith that they will do it and then patience when they don't do it to not get upset and, you know, try and understand, okay, where do you need help to make that happen? So I think the first two are important, but the patience is like the biggest one because, you know, people will disappoint you, people will make mistakes. So rather than like, I guess being prepared for that a little bit helps create a better environment for them as well. So yeah, that's, that's it. That's it. It's amazing and it still surprises me that you can uh, even factor in time for fun amongst all these ventures and, and being a mother but it's something that you touched on there which is you know meeting them where they are and even this this fun element it's the idea of that sort of physical engagement and it you know it, just to, even in the smallest way mm. like you know the the case of say if we were doing uh, business of mm. some sort mm -hmm. and then you uh, uh you were to say yeah sure sure let's proceed and then you know i go for a handshake but you, you refuse to do it right you've said that you want to do you want to engage in business but yeah. you refuse to shake, my, shake hand. my hand yeah i'll think that's something's wrong right yeah. right but ju just that personal connection is is the idea i'm trying to get to it doesn't mean you have to go around and hug every em employee no. all the time no. but um being able to generate that forms that trusting bond mm -hmm. that this is a genuine trusting partnership yeah but go going back to you know my initial point there amongst having these ventures you know leading the change yourself which i think is very important right you're not just sitting at the top and guiding um, mm. a bunch of people mm. uh, being a mother and then you know balancing this all how do you manage to do that in a way that keeps all of your pillars in life 
balanced? I don't think you can. Right. You know, I, I always think something's off kilter all the time. Like there's always something is not quite right. You know, like maybe leaving a legacy. Oh my God, we forgot to do our thousand tree planting last week because the shipment didn't come in. Okay, it's not the end of the world. Quantum, a client's not happy. How do we fix that? I don't think you're ever going to get to a place where like all pillars singing with unison and there's no problems. I think being, I guess, multifaceted as a person and then having those passions and doing all these different things requires you to be flexible that sometimes things just don't go the way they're supposed to. And I'm very accepting of that. You know, whereas some of the t- members in my team will be the first ones to get stressed going, oh my God, we didn't need a da I'm like, calm down. It's okay. So that's, I guess, my modus operandi. It's like, okay, it's fine. Things will screw up. I yeah. fully expect that to happen. And I've kind of taken that into my parenting as well. Like, you know, I think I've said this on like previous, a previous podcast where I'm like, you can't set yourself up to be perfect because otherwise you're just chasing a falsity. You're just chasing something that's never really going to exist. And you'll just drive yourself crazy as well. So I think one of the things I also make sure that I'm doing is always got to have like a Netflix and chill day you've always got to have a switch off the phone don't look at it day sometimes you got to have a I don't want my kid around day Mm -hmm. like you just need to honor that sometimes that's what you need and you know for everyone who's listening there's nothing like perfect entrepreneur perfect mom perfect boss none of those things I mean everyone I work with knows I'm not perfect they know I'll snap they know I have a temper like we all just know these things about each other so by building all these companies and I I guess to a certain extent handpicking who works with me We've built this really awesome like family dynamic, you know, so it's not hard work. It's kind of like living with your family. And so you can shout at each other and yell at each other and someone's feeling upset. It's all good. All of that happens behind closed doors. But when it's time to like get to work, we all tuck in and do the work. And I think that's the best part. People always chase the, are you all happy and perfect? I'm like, no, look at what you're like when you all tuck in and get on with the work. That's the true magic. Everything else around it's just noise or ways you're coping with life, I think. I love that. Yeah, yeah I love that. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You so much. This is so much fun. I didn't even know I would unpack all this stuff. So this was really, really interesting. I loved it. And like I said in the beginning, you know, someone coming from a similar background to me, but with a different upbringing, mm. really allows me to reflect on some things that I've never even thought of, even yeah. through the conversations that I've had with my own family. So I love everything that you're doing and really, really look forward to what's happening next. If anyone did want to reach out to you, Mm -hmm. what's your most preferred way of people getting in contact? I mean, find me on Instagram or LinkedIn. Those are the, I mean, I'm always on them. So you'll be talking to me and not talking to anyone else when you do that. So yeah, that's just the best way to reach out to me. Um, and through LinkedIn, obviously, you have all the all the details of the various companies and, you know, their website. So I always like to use LinkedIn as like my central point to right. go, go in and then find whatever you want from there. Yeah. Thanks yeah. so much. You're welcome. And we have a closing tradition on the show sure. where I always gather a list of the questions that previous guests mm-hmm. ask. Yes. So the two questions that I've chosen for you. Mm. Firstly, what do people misunderstand about you the most that because of how much I've achieved I'm quite bullish and strong I'm really not I'm like a small little Indian girl who used to get bullied at school and I'm still shy and still timid and I still get nervous so yeah I, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have there guessed you go that, yeah so. every every time I say that everyone's like what I yeah. never have thought that I'm like yeah and the second question if you could have a coffee with one person in history who would it be and what would you ask them? Queen Elizabeth. Yeah. I think she's such a fascinating character in history, obviously. We, you know, she only died a few, well, last year in September. But I just think she's met so many people. So it's like if you want to sit with one person who's like the encyclopedia of everyone else, she's the person. So yeah, I would love to sit and have a coffee with her. I don't know how much she would share, <laughs> yeah. given how proper she would have to be. But I'd like to think that given that she's no longer with us, maybe if I was to meet her and have a coffee, she could be as candid as she wants because she's like, I'm not wearing the crown anymore so I can talk about all of this. Yeah, Yeah. you know, off the record. Off the record, exactly. Post-retirement. Yeah, Yeah, literally. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you again so much. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed this. Yeah.